You're listening to the Lessons in Real Estate Show, sponsored by Mission First Capital, bringing real estate investment deals for active duty and veteran investors. Your host, Anthony Pinto, searched land, air, and sea to find military investors just like you investing in multifamily and commercial real estate, both active duty and veterans. Hear their stories, learn their lessons, and be inspired by the obstacles they have overcome on their path to financial freedom. Whether you are overseas or stationed at home, if you want to get started as a military real estate investor, this is the show for you. And now your host, Anthony Pinto. Hey learners and welcome to a, another edition of the Lessons in Real Estate show. I'm your host, Anthony Pinto, and today we have another awesome guest who kind of brings a unique uh, perspective to real estate investing. Uh, Doug Norman served for 20 years of active duty in uh, Huya the Submarine Force and retired in 2002. Uh, his spouse and him, uh, who's also a Navy reservist, reached financial freedom in 1999. And uh, they've been living in Hawaii for the past 30 years and also raised a, uh, another Navy, Navy girl, married to actually one of my classmates from the academy. Super excited about that. And uh, these days, Doug enjoys surfing, slow travel, writing, public speaking, uh, reading, and a number of other uh, hobbies, as well as uh, you know, writing a few different books, which we'll get to in, in here as well. Um, and uh, you know, Doug, I'm really excited to have you on. So welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Anthony. I, uh, I've enjoyed listening to your episode where you had Corey Chonsky on to talk about apartment syndications. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm enjoying the content. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, he, uh, Corey's a, a good guy. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's a, a small world. He ends up, uh, he's working with a guy who used to be one of my department heads on my submarine as well. So it's, uh, <laughs> I'm sure he'll it's, forgive you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's a crazy small world in the military here. So, um, you know, so no, I appreciate you coming on here because I think you know what we're going to plan on talking about today is uh, is something that is you know um, often thought about, but when it actually happens, which is financial freedom, you know what's what happens after that, you know, uh, and, and I'm excited to kind of see where where that conversation goes. But you know, let's start off with your your military background and uh, how you got into mm -hmm. real estate in the first place. Well, my military background is in the 1980s and 1990s. And back then, the conventional wisdom was that you're going to buy a home at every duty station. And eventually, you'd have five or six homes, and then you'd retire from the military. And the reasoning behind that was that real estate always went up. Uh, that was not true back in the 1980s or 1990s any more than it's true today. <laughs> but back then, military families really didn't have a, an access to the tools or to the financing or any of the methods that's out there now since the web has taken off. So in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, you were pretty much restricted to investing in the area around you, you know, within your zip code or five or 10 miles. And after that, then you hoped that you'd stay in the area a long time if you were going to manage your property by yourself or you knew you had to build a team before you moved on. And so people would do that. And I don't think we really had any accurate uh, analysis of how well that worked. Uh, personally, you know, we bought one home and lost some money on it, uh, bought another home at another duty station and made some money on it. Very lucky timing there. Uh, when we landed in Hawaii, of course, the very next thing we did was buy a home again. Uh, by that time, uh, the Hawaii state real estate market went through a prolonged recession. We bought at the top of the market in 1989 hmm. and we watched homes slide in value all the way through the 1990s to the early part of 2000, a 10 year drop in prices. And at the end of it, the house we bought in 1989 was worth less than we had paid for it, worth less than we'd paid for the improvements, all the things we'd done to it in the meantime. And at that point, people were actually considering walking away from homes back then. Now, if you had the guts to invest back then in 1999, 2000, at the end of that recession, uh, you look like a genius. But the reality was that it had just depressed everybody and everyone had given up and was abandoning the market. It's just like pretending that the stock market is going to go to zero. Uh, that's how we felt about real estate then. Mm -hmm. uh, we. We still own that home today, uh, and it's a symptom of the way the market was back then. It was easier for us to upgrade from that home to our home we're living in today that we've owned for 20 years. And it was easier to hold that first home that we had bought in 1989 just to wait for the market to recover. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a stark reality to what, you, what you're seeing now, the fact that real estate would actually go down in value like that. And, you know, and even during the Great Recession, you know, we had, 
here back in 2008, 2009 timeframe, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, real estate went down, but it, we, you know, it pretty quickly went back up over these past few years. And, and to imagine, <laughs> to imagine real estate doing something opposite of what it's doing now, it's just, it's, it's almost unfathomable. Um, and you know, it, I think is a testament to your, your, your willpower to stick with it and stick with that home when, you know, a lot of people probably would have, would have jumped ship and, uh, and got rid of that. Yep. So, you know, so kind of along that train of thought, um, you never know when the, when the bottom was going to end, it could have been five years, it could have been 10 years, it could have been 20 years. So what was going through your mind mm -hmm. that, that, uh, w that allowed you to keep that property through all of that? Uh, up and down. Well, one, one, one part of it was that we <clears throat> we came to Hawaii in 89 and then in 1994 we transferred to San Diego uh, and we thought well we're done with Hawaii you know we've been here for four and a half five years and it's time to move on and when we went to San Diego now you know if you're stationed in San Diego and you can't be anywhere else and can't be in Hawaii it's a nice place mm -hmm. but every time that we had a chance to travel back to Hawaii during that tour the landing in Honolulu felt more like coming home than landing at the airport in San Diego. That was a hint. And so we got back to Hawaii in 1997. We had rented out this place that we had first bought in 89. We rented it out for three years. And then when we came back in 97, uh, the recession in real estate had gotten even worse and the house was worth even less. Uh, so we were fixing it up. We wanted to have a place that was livable. You know, you need a new roof and you need to keep up with the maintenance and repairs. And we, we did that. Uh, and one of the things that we noticed around 1998, 1999, we can do math. And if you're going to upgrade a home, it's far better to upgrade your home when everyone else's homes cost less money, even if you're going to lose money in your home, mm -hmm. than it is to do it at the top of the market. You're going to lose money selling the house that you're selling to upgrade, but you're going to buy the upgrade house at a much cheaper price than you normally would pay. And the math works out to it's actually a better deal in the long run. Mm -hmm. So we've always been interested in home improvement. We've always been interested in real estate and it was easy to adapt our lifestyle to start going to open houses uh, and looking around at houses that were for sale coming on the market. And sure enough, just like in 1989, we had found a, a, an old rental property that had been beaten down and neglected and need a lot of sweat equity. And in 2000, we found one of those all over again beaten down, neglected, and a wonderful opportunity to fix it up with sweat equity, uh, which we have done for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we did that. Now, I would like to pretend that we were brilliant investors, that we held on to the previous property for its, uh, its wonderful cash flow and a whole bunch of other uh, financial analysis. The reality is we're way too busy. Uh, we were both on active duty at the time. I was wrapping up my career, but still had plenty of work to keep me occupied. Uh, my spouse was also on active duty, contemplating going to the reserves. We we're raising a, a seven-year-old, and we just had no time to do a simultaneous buy and sell the first property. So we moved into the uh, second home. That's our residence today. We rented out the first property. That worked pr pretty well. Um, uh, another tip for professional real estate investors, you know, you've probably heard this one before, but you have heard you shouldn't rent your house to families. And uh, at that point, at that point, uh, uh, in early 2001, uh, my parents-in-law came out to Hawaii to watch their granddaughter grow up. And so we ended up renting to them for another six and a half years. And by the time they went back to the mainland, the property had started to recover. But by then, life was a little easier. We had retired from the military. We were financially independent. We had the time to work on real estate. We were still working on that rental property, still working on this one. It became more of a lifestyle than a financial decision. Uh, I know today from reading about real estate on websites and, and, and doing the analysis that it's probably going to be a, an investment that you want to get at least a 6% capitalization rate, right? You probably could invest in a stock market and do very little in an index fund for a 6% return. If you're going to invest in real estate, uh, you probably want to get at least that much back from it. Uh, and in Hawaii, the one we're renting uh, now, the property that we have now is only about a 4% cap rate. So it's, it's really a suboptimal performer. And eventually you start thinking about your exit strategy. Uh, I've noticed over the years that everybody has a plan on getting into real estate and they have a great plan for growing real estate. But I, I don't know, do you see many exit strategies? Because I do not. I, I see a default exit strategy of probate. 
You know, that that's a really good point and, and a good a good segue yeah. into, you know, talking about being a, an accidental landlord. Um, you know, yeah. I think a lot of people and especially now that kind of the conventional wisdom is uh, you know, you can use your VA loan to house hack a property and, and to some extent it's still kind of, you know, buy at each duty station. Um yep. but if unless you're planning on selling it right when you leave, it's really gonna be a rental property. And I don't think that a lot of investors fully understand what that means, both in terms of their um, their level of involvement, but also the financial kind of breakdown behind that when you first buy. Because, you know, it's it's not suddenly going to start cash flowing from you from when you leave and you have mo- okay. your renters move in. Like the numbers aren't just suddenly going to work. And so, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's paramount to kind of understand that from in the beginning. So, you know, let's yeah. kind of dig into the exit strategies that, you know, you, you are trying to trumpeting or you've seen or you think are the kind of the best ones for, for beginners who are, you maybe just have a VA loan and that's all they, you know, kind of have under their belt to get started with. I, I would say that if you're in a position where you've decided to buy a home, that you have two paths you can choose. Uh, one path is you're going to buy a home because for whatever reason, that's the right decision at the time. And usually those are for a better school system in the neighborhood, or you have pets that you aren't able to find a place for in, in base housing. Uh, maybe for some other reason, it becomes smart to you to buy a home. I mean, most, most of the military families that communicate with me on this, they bought a home for what seemed like a good reason at the time. If you're going to do that, uh, you should buy a home that will be a good rental property when you leave. Uh, instead of buying a lovely home that works out for everything that you want from a home, look at it as if that's something that maybe you would buy as an investment rental property. Mm-hmm. And I'd suggest you want to go a step further and maybe you want to buy a, a crappy home. Maybe you want to buy a home that's been neglected, maybe even a little abused. Uh, you probably want a home that's got potential, good neighborhood, good schools, high walkability score. But Maybe you've got the do-it-yourself skills or the time to arrange for contractors and improve that property while you're living there. Uh, Another option is house hacking, right? If you're single or newly married, maybe it makes sense to rent out a room or two in your property or even even use your VA loan to buy a duplex or triplex. Uh, That's a very big step, buying a multifamily home when you're buying your first home. But on the other hand, you know that you're going to be covered by having tenants that are paying some rent. You're going to have some chance to save some of your housing allowance. And by house hacking, either with rooms in your property or multifamily, you're going to leave with some cash flow and you're going to be able to do better after you've moved out. You probably won't have to sell. And, and you've seen, you know, an average tour of two or three years that the property barely appreciates enough to handle all the costs of your purchase when you bought it. And then, getting it ready for sale, and then the commissions and closing costs of selling it. So you've owned a place for three years. You've leveraged it with a VA loan. You've probably leveraged it very heavily. And if everything goes right, you're probably not going to lose any money. That's the optimal response, the optimal result there. Mm -hmm. And if you had any volatility in the market, if anything glitched, if anything went bad, or if anything happened, then all, all of a sudden you're highly leveraged and facing losses. And that's usually what I hear from people is they bought a very nice home, but it's a bad investment rental property and now they can't sell it. And to compound the whole problem even worse, they're not necessarily able to do the math. They've got a mortgage. They're thrilled to be able to cover the mortgage with the rent. That's that's their happy place Mm -hmm. is cash flow neutral. And you and I know that is not at all cash flow neutral. By the end of the year, you're going to have maintenance and repairs and vacancy rates and many other things to worry about. If you had entered the purchase as a prospective landlord and read about on that and thought about that and planned for that, then you'd be all right. As an accidental landlord though, it's going to be a very expensive tuition. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's a, that's an interesting thought because you know, a lot of the guys that I, that I, uh, well, sailors that I talk to, you know, when they use their VA loan, they buy like the, the nice house that, uh, you know, is the best on the block and they're pretty much just max out what their VA loan can get them without fully understanding that most of the time, those houses are not the ones that are going to be able to make you any money yeah, in the end. Not at all. Right. Um, yep. you know, especially if it's on the multifamily side, like you're not going to find a multifamily that is, uh, I guess, depending on your level of comfort, um, you know, up to what you would probably want to, to live in if you're living kind of high class and can max out your VA, yeah. your VA loan. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be pretty, 
pretty pricey, you know, and that's something that I was kind of looking at when I first got started in, in smaller multifamily is uh, mm. the areas that you're going to find the good deals that are going to make sense as, as cash flowing rentals uh, for, you know, smaller multifamily and, and to some extent, single family homes is uh, probably not going to be the areas where you're uh, one and necessarily going to live, especially if you have a family, uh, you yeah. know, as a single, as a single sailor or a single officer, um, probably a lot easier uh, to, to uh, make that calculus in your head. But I, re- <laughs> I remember when, um, when my wife and I were first working at our quad that we were going to use, um, that we we're going to buy to house hack for about a year before we came out here to Japan. Um, uh-huh. You know, it, we, we knew roughly where this property was in Norfolk, but uh, we didn't really know <laughs> where it was. And so, uh, you know, we're looking at this online. It's like, oh, babe, like, you know, there's this four unit and right, like literally right next to it is another four unit and they're owned by the same person. We could get two for one deal. And uh, we went and actually drove by this property. And, uh, you know, there's like people staring at us as we're like getting out of the car, like right next door. And like across the street, there's this um, like old junkyard with a whole bunch of like rusted out trucks. And it's on, it was on the wrong side of the train tracks. It was just, it, it did, you know, it location really does matter. And that property, um, you know, would have cash flowed us quite a bit of money, but it just, location just didn't work for us you know as a as a couple and and thank god like you know when we actually started walking around inside of it and seeing and, and putting eyes on you start to see a lot of issues but um oh, yeah. but you know i mean that just is kind of to the point where a lot of these properties you're looking at that are probably good as rentals may not be as good as a fan as a you know a starter home for for you and your family yep. that's something to consider as well and the other advice I give people is if you want to invest in real estate, then then invest in real estate and uh, don't become an accidental landlord. Instead, go to a new duty station. Great, but live on base or rent and try to rent a place where it will let you save up more of your housing allowance and free up some cash flow from your housing allowance. Mm-hmm. And then go invest in rental properties wherever wherever it makes sense to do that. And so that we see some of that in Hawaii. People want to come here, uh, leverage up with a VA loan on a median townhouse price of $400,000 or a median single family home price of $800,000 uh, buy it. And they have many rosy stories of people staying here for three or four years and getting capital gains of $150,000. Uh, and those are the happy stories. And then of course you never hear the stories of people that break even or lose money. Uh, but if you come out here and rent on your housing allowance, then you've got a chance to invest anywhere in the world. And it's probably going to be on the mainland where it makes better sense, right? You've got all the tools to research properties in the mainland. If you're in the military and you're going to be a long distance landlord at some point anyway, this is a great time to learn how to build a team on the mainland. And maybe you'll live in Hawaii, but you'll be investing in places with glamorous uh, zip codes like Oklahoma, Nebraska, Michigan, Missouri, they don't sound very, uh, very interesting. They don't sound very glamorous, but uh, on the other hand, if you can get a capitalization ratio of, you know, eight, 10, 12%, and you have a property management team in place to help make it work much better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and then that's a good point is you gotta, you gotta pick your markets that uh, you want to necessarily invest in because it may not be right next door to you. You know, I know a lot of guys who, uh, one of my, uh, roommates from college that actually reached out to me is in San Diego. It's like, Hey, you know, I'm looking at this property and, you know, I think it might be a good fit. And I was like, well, like, why are you trying to buy in California? Like, it, it, <laughs> I don't, I didn't think he fully understood like what, yeah, just because you had the ability to buy in California, you have a VA loan doesn't mean you should use it. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's like, Oh yeah, well my, yeah. And, and my point is, is you really need to know the markets that you're getting into and know, particularly what taxes are going to do as well. I mean, that, that is a, is a big killer that a lot of people don't think about, especially if you're going to be improving a property, if you're buying it for low and doing a number of improvements and now suddenly it's worth and assessed a lot more. Uh, for, yep. for, for example, I bought, we bought a triplex. The taxes were like, I don't know, like $500 a year, something like that. And then, uh, <laughs> and we realized that the property hadn't been reassessed since it was essentially uh, completely torn down and rebuilt back up. And so suddenly we're fa- facing like 2200 I think uh-huh. a year in taxes without uh-huh. without it, we even thinking that that was going to happen. And so, you know, things like that happen a lot. Tax reassessments, 
Uh, you have vacancies that you have to deal with, uh, you know, depending on how old the property is. I mean, maintenance and repairs can you know, can be 10 or percent or more of the amount of income you have coming in. And, you know, it's just things that a lot of people don't think about. So, you know, what kind of advice do you have for those guys in terms of accounting for operating expenses uh, when, when evaluating a property to start off with? Oh, it's, it's the classic thumb rules. I mean, we've probably all heard them if you've spent any time hanging out on the real estate websites, but there's the 1% thumb rule where you ideally would buy a house that's going to rent monthly rent of 1% of the purchase price. If you find a $100,000 property, the 1% thumb rule says that you're ideally going to get $1,000 a month rent. And maybe that's the case. Maybe that's not. It's a very good screening tool. If uh, you are looking at properties and they're like Oahu, where the thumb rule is more like 0.4%, then you're probably going to pass up a lot of properties that would make you unhappy. Mm -hmm. So start with a 1% thumb rule. Now, you know, clearly if a property is close to that, like 0.9%, well, maybe there's something you can do. Maybe you have an idea of how you can improve the rent Mm -hmm. And, and experienced investors know a lot of tools and tips for doing that. But that, that's a good filter. And, and the other filter that I think military families fail to appreciate when they're just getting started is the 50% thumb rule, which says half the money you get for that tenant is going to go to vacancies, repairs, maintenance, taxes, and other expenses of maintaining the property. So if you're expecting to make as much money in rent as you're paying out in your mortgage, you're already losing money. If you're going to have twice as much rent coming in as the mortgage, you're probably going to be okay. You're probably going to break even, maybe even get a little bit ahead as long as you have good tenants and, you know, nothing really bad happens like a hurricane or a broken water pipe. Mm -hmm. So those two thumb rules alone, once people sit down and start looking at the numbers and working through that, I mean, the 1% thumb rule kind of uh, leads into a cap rate of 6%. And if you're using the 1% thumb rule and getting a cap rate of 6%, then maybe it makes sense to invest in a property. Uh, But on the other hand, maybe you just want to go buy a Vanguard total stock market index fund that's probably going to return about 6% in the long term Mm -hmm. with about 1% of the effort that you would have had to put into a property as a landlord. So maybe that's a better lifestyle. And we we have these discussions all the time. Uh, There's the predatory... mm, sometimes overly enthusiastic realtors uh, who will make it sound as though you're losing money, right? You're giving away your housing allowance and you're just collecting rent receipts. Or even the lenders who will say, well, yeah, sure, of course we can loan you $700,000 because it's the Veterans Administration and the VA loan will will let you leverage up to uh, incredible levels. If we did the same thing in the stock market, can you imagine if somebody was going to let you borrow $700,000 to invest in the stock market and, and was only going to charge you 3%? I think people would run away screaming, but when it comes to being a homeowner, suddenly that's okay. Mm-hmm. So those are the issues that you want to look at when you're considering that kind of uh, investment. And again, when you're stationed at a duty station for what, two, three years? You know, you and I went through our training pipeline for two years before we even really first got to our duty station, and we never stayed at a place for longer than six or seven months. And then once you got good at what you were doing, it was time to start talking about orders, right? You're probably looking at orders at about the two and a half year point. Three years would have been considered a long tour. Mm -hmm. And I've learned from talking to families in all the military services that two and a half, three years eh, might seem like a long tour. There are places where transfers are occurring every 18 months to two years. Mm-hmm. If you're doing well and you're moving up and you're moving on, if you've been buying a home in every duty station, then you're going to have to build a very good team to keep those properties rented out Absolutely. as compared to, as compared to having a team waiting for you in Kansas, right? You've built one team in Kansas and you're buying several properties in Kansas with that one team. Maybe that's a little easier and a little more profitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that, that's a that's a good point, and the strategies there of being more intentional versus being uh, yep. um, convenient for you, I think, is uh, definitely yep. calculus to think about. Um, you know, I kind of want to shift gears here a little bit because yep. it's not often that we uh, have someone on the show who is financially free and financially independent. And uh, you know, I think a lot of us who are kind of on that path and just getting started, or or you know, along the path to financial independence. 
are trying to shoot for that number and it's, you know, $10,000 a month, 20,000, whatever it is. And it's just that golden number and you have it printed on your wall <laughs> and you're getting, you're like inching yourself up closer and closer to it. And then you hit it and it's just like, okay, like I'm financially free. Like what, what does that actually mean? What is that? You know, what do I do with that? So you know, talk to us about, you know, what it really means about you financially free and, and what have you kind of done with that? And in, in your, you know, what, almost what, 20 years or so you've been financially independent. It's, it, it's been uh, since 1999 was when we first reached financial independence. So I retired from active duty in 2002. So we've been working financially independent for over 20 years and, and our retired life over, over 18 years. Um, I'll clarify what financially independent means. It's mm -hmm. meaning that your investment portfolio that you've built up has assets of 25 times your annual spending. Uh, 25 times is the inverse of a 4% safe withdrawal rate. Uh, I'm not here to to talk about the details of the 4% safe withdrawal rate, but if your assets get to 25 times your annual spending, that's a tripwire. You are probably financially independent. And another way to do it is when you're investing in real estate and your cash flow from the real estate equals your expenses, right? If you have been following the 1% thumb rule and a 50% thumb rule, at some point you're gonna realize that you've earned $10,000 net over the last year in your investment rental properties, and you've got annual spending less than that. Suddenly you're financially independent on cash flow from investment rental properties. And the temptation is to decide what you want to do next. If you've become financially independent from the cash flow of what's effectively a lifestyle business of a dozen, maybe two dozen investment rental properties, now what? Do you want to keep that lifestyle business going for another 40 years and find other things to do because you've got the properties fairly in autopilot? Or do you want to level up and become a, a property guru? Do you want to have 40, 50, 150, however many doors you want to get? Do you want to start becoming a syndicator, a hard money lender, or a private lender? I mean, there's a whole uh, horizon out there or a whole universe of opportunities once you reach that point where you realize you're financially free. Uh, if this happens while you're on active duty, uh, the very first thing you're going to do probably is go talk with your community manager or your assignment officer and, and start negotiating from a position of strength. Uh, we've all seen people that are 12, 14, 16 years of active duty, and for whatever reason, there's no longer challenged and fulfilled. They are starting to burn out, but they've got debt. They don't have enough assets. They're a little bit worried about making it in a civilian world, and they're essentially gutting it out to 20. And that's a very depressing situation to find yourself in where you're afraid to leave the military because you don't think you'll be able to succeed. But I also talk quite a bit with the military families who have been in that same position 12, 14, 16 years, and they are already financially independent. They've either got the assets or they've got the cash flow from investment rental properties. And now they want to know why they would stick around for 20. What, what do they get out of staying till 20? It's true that you get a nice pension and cheap health care. Uh, however, if you've reached financial independence on your own, maybe you don't need that pension anymore, or maybe you can go buy health care. Uh, and those are opportunities that we really, in the military, we really know very little about that because we've never had to deal with putting up assets mm -hmm. of our own to live for the rest of our lives. It's easier to look at that pension and see that as what you really want to get. We've never had to go out and negotiate health care or health insurance. And so again, it, it's a big unknown and it's kind of scary. And so you're tempted to stay for that pension, even though you're already financially free. Mm -hmm. uh, and a little intermediate step in there, uh, and, and there are several people that are doing this right now, is to leave active duty for the reserves or the National Guard. And you can drill, you know, you're going to do that legendary weekend a month and two weeks a year. Uh, hopefully that's what really happens. And, and you're able to work on your investments or your or investment rental property career while you're still a drilling reservist. And that will eventually get you to 20 years and to a reserve pension around age 60, which is great. It's nice to have that annuity income. But again, if you've built up 25 times assets, then you're probably going to have enough for the rest of your life already. Or if you've got cash flow from investment rental properties, well, maybe that's just as good as a military pension. And so those are difficult decisions, difficult discussions to have, but they're very powerful. And if you don't get the assignment you want for your next tour, well, that's the point where you can leave active duty and uh, change your career. And I watch people do that frequently now that 
now that the financial independence math is fairly well understood and the movement has grown in size with the growth of the World Wide Web, now people understand how to make it happen. And we've all been able to reach out to each other and build a community that can network and understand all the risks. Mm -hmm. So that's what that looks like. And the biggest question is, you know, I've reached that goal. Now what? And, and the answer is, well, life goes on. You still have to do chores. You still have to do maintenance. You're still parenting. You know, all those, ha all those things happen. Uh, you gain 40 hours a week of your life back. And you're probably going to spend a lot of that with family taking naps, recovering, right? Uh, De-stressing, maybe uh, exercising, recovering your health. Those are all the things that happen for that first year after the transition. But what you're really doing when you reach that financial independence is you've changed one process of getting to financial independence for another process of living the best life you can and figuring out what that looks like. And it, it will probably look something like more time with family, It'll probably look something like exploring interests and hobbies that you've had that you never felt like you had enough time to work on. It'll look like traveling and, and maybe adding some more money into the entertainment budget. And it might, you know, if you're in Hawaii, it look a lot more like surfing more. Or if you're on the mainland, maybe it looks more like golf or hiking or whatever you enjoy doing outdoors. And it's a process. You've, you've reached the goal line. You've reached financial independence, but now you need a process for the rest of your life. And that's just a, a conventional journey that will change maybe every five or 10 years. Uh, you would like to live happily ever after, but there's other things that will pop up in the next five or 10 years of financial independence. And you'll have more time in your life to deal with that because you're not chained to a desk or a corporate career. You're not feeling like you're slaving away. So you do have more mental bandwidth to handle the surprises that life throws at you, which is very powerful. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that, that is, that's uh, really a lot of really great points. And I think um, when people are trying to evaluate what they want to get out at, you know, 10 years or six years or eight years, definitely being able to negotiate from a position of strength is, uh, is yep. it relieves a lot of stress that you otherwise would have when you feel like you're, you're trapped yep. and you have to go on to the next duty station. Um, you know, one of the I don't know how many people I, you know that picked up the nuke bonus, right? Because they had mm -hmm. a car payment, because mm -hmm. they're paying off student loans, and now they've decided they're going to go out there and be a, a submarine department head for that righteous. Is it still thirty five thousand dollars a year? Uh, Forty five is there. Forty five. Oh yeah, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good chunk of money. I would, I would. Yeah, it's a good chunk of money. It's tempting, right? And uh -huh. and it's hard to believe that you're worth more than that if you were to go out there and pursue your real estate career, or more than that if you were out to go out there and pursue a corporate career. But I would say that it's uh, adjusted for inflation. It's about the same kind of bonus people were handing out back in the seventies or the eighties. Mm -hmm. Forty five thousand dollars a year. Wow. <laughs> You, know, you, you and I need to talk more later. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, you know, one of the things that's it's really interesting to me when people are evaluating if they want to get out, um, particularly now that I'm I'm close to getting out and I'm talking with people who are pretty much getting straight out from here, is that, you know, they don't really have a plan for afterwards. And, and I think a lot of people are worried about what is what happens afterwards, right? You know, I'm here, I have you know, guaranteed income coming in, I just have to deal with some BS here on the side, go on a, on a submarine or a ship for a certain amount of time. But you know, I get guaranteed income coming in, my housing's paid for great health care. Um, you know, what do you tell to those guys who are like, Oh, man, I really, like, I don't know what skills I have out or outside the Navy that I could go, you know, I could go do or I don't have, you know, I don't have a, a strong idea of what I want to do if I want to go back to school, if I want to go into this career. Uh, and it seemed very uncertain for a lot of people. You know, what advice do you have for those guys who are kind of having that mindset? I, I got I got the same advice there where I asked, well, what am I going to do? And the answer was, oh, whatever you want. And I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, but here's, let's go into more, some specific, more specific details. The first thing you're going to do, I think, is every time you come up on an obligation, every time you come up where you have a chance to leave, either at the end of an enlistment or at the end of a, a service contract, pretend you're getting out. What would that look like? Uh, and ask yourself the questions. You know, are you still looking forward to your workday? Are you challenged and fulfilled by, by the job you're doing in the military? That, that's not the same as happy. That's just challenged and fulfilled. Mm -hmm. and, and look at the people who are a little more senior to you. you know, look and see what, what they're doing. Are they happy? Do they look like they're enjoying it? You know, I, I always use the example of your XO and your CO. You know, do you see yourself down the road being that XO, being that CO? Does that, does that interest you? Do they look happy? And everybody has a slightly different answer on that. 
And so you're practicing, you're practicing for that transition that you might have to make uh, next tour or five years from now, but you're going to have to make that transition eventually. If the answer is that you're feeling challenged to fulfill, uh, go ahead and stay on active duty, give it another two, three years. Uh, but if you're not, uh, and if you're practicing the idea of making that transition, uh, you're going to do some things. The first thing you're going to do is go look at your LinkedIn profile, of course, and, and update it. You're probably going to, you're probably going to take off that, that, person picture of you in a uniform, uh, you're probably going to dress in civilian clothes, get a, a good headshot. But what you're really going to do with your LinkedIn profile is you're going to go look at other LinkedIn profiles and try to imagine yourself in their position. Uh, one of the best places to go on LinkedIn if you're in the military is called Veteran Mentor Network. It's one of the largest groups on LinkedIn, and it's got a very well-defined process for helping you make the transition. And so you go to the Veteran Mentor Network and you're going to look at all the other people there and read the discussions and figure out what they're doing. And essentially what they do is they say, well, what interests you? Try to figure that out first. And then think about what industry you want to move into. Do you want to be a program manager? Do you want to be somebody financial? Do you want to come out and do something completely different, like go out and be a school teacher? Find something that looks interesting and then explore that industry. Ask questions. What, what is your industry like? What does your industry do? What do I have to qualify? What kind of transition do I have to do? Do I need to get an MBA right now? Do I need to get any certifications or skills out of the military before I make the transition? Those are the questions you ask on Veteran Mentor Network. And then after a while, you'll find an industry. Maybe you'll find two industries. And you'll start looking at the individual companies and Think about a half a dozen companies in that industry. What are they like to work for? What's your day look like? How much travel do you have to do at your job? Uh, oh, by the way, how much money do you make? These are all questions that you're doing. What you're doing is you're networking for information. You're just gathering information on the, on the transition and asking people for their wisdom. Uh, it seems counterintuitive, but there are literally over 100,000 veterans in that group who would love to help you avoid repeating their mistakes. They want to make sure you do better on your transition than they did on theirs. And notice that in this whole time when you're researching and asking questions and networking, you're not asking for a job. You're not even writing a resume. You're just trying to explore and figure out. Eventually, you get to the point where you'll decide that you want to be in this specific industry and maybe working at one or two of these companies. And that's when you start narrowing it down. You start talking to the, to the people that work there or people that used to work there and will you know, tell you what it's really like to have worked there. And you just want to narrow down how that transition would go and how that would look. Now, as, as a military officer or as a fairly skilled enlisted technician, you're also able to go talk to a recruiter or a headhunter. And that can certainly smooth the path a little bit. But you're probably not at that point yet when you're still a year away from the end of your obligation. You're probably still networking for information, pretending what getting out looks like. And I would say that if you do this every three to four years in the military, when you're getting your decision point, after a while, you get very comfortable with asking these questions and thinking about your interests and your skills and what other people have done. And you'll get closer and closer to making that decision for real when you're ready. Uh, another resource besides LinkedIn's Veteran Mentor Network is uh, uh, Justin Nasiri's podcast and website Beyond a Uniform. I don't know if you've heard of that before, mm -hmm. uh, but Beyond the Uniform is over 300 podcast episodes of veterans who have made the transition. And what I like about Justin is he not only talks about how was your transition and what did you do and where are you now, he circles back and he comes back two or three years later to somebody to find out, hey, what's going on in your life? How did that transition go? What are you doing now? Is life even better? Do you wish you were you know, back on mid watches and, and standing duty weekends? Do you miss it? What's your life like? So those are both very valuable sources of information to think about the transition. You're, you're going to do it eventually. It might take you 20, 25, 30 years to make that transition or it might happen at the five-year point, but you're going to make it. So take the time to learn about it. And, and then I tell people that I wish that I had made the time to learn about it. Uh, and when I was at a, an inflection point in my career, I was a staff officer at a, a submarine type commander mm -hmm. and I had absolutely no spare bandwidth. I was working, you know, 78 hour weeks, on-call nights, on-call weekends, responding to the crisis. And I barely had enough time to get through the day, let alone think about the transition, think about learning something about the Navy Reserve, thinking about next steps. It just wasn't something I was able to ever make the time, even though I should have made the time to figure out that transition. If I had, 
I probably would have gone to the reserves at about the 10 or 12 year point instead of gutting it out to 20. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, a lot of great, a lot of great advice there. And, and I'm definitely going to check them out myself as I, as I get closer here oh, yeah. to, to getting out. Um, veteran mentor network and beyond the uniform podcast. Now I appreciate, I appreciate the, the, the advice there. Cause I think it's, um, I think it's a hot topic for a lot of people. And I think it's, uh, it's something that is, um, I, I personally have never been to G T G P S or whatever they're calling it now. Yep. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> or the transition seminar. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. And, uh, but I've heard that it's not, um, not the most useful for actually preparing you for what life is going to be like, uh, afterwards. So no, I appreciate, I appreciate, uh, you dropping that nod there. Uh, you, but you will hear about LinkedIn. Uh, if you go to the transition seminar, you will hear about how to get your veterans disability screening. You will hear about getting a federal civil service. There is value in going to the transition program. If nothing else, you'll make sure you know your benefits. But you're right. Uh, if you've been doing any financial literacy whatsoever, there's going to be entire sections of that seminar where you're going to be sitting there wishing you were planning your career instead of listening to the talk. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, Doug. Well, we're getting towards the end of the show. You want to get into the snapshot yeah. round? Absolutely. It's been a All long right. time since I've had to do a snapshot. <laughs> You know, no one ever gets it. No one ever asked me about it. No one, you know, it's, I, I haven't actually, I think you're the very first submariner I've had on before. So I appreciate that. Uh, there, there you go. That. <laughs> Just get right. those muzzle doors open before you get the flank bell. That's all you have to worry about. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, here we go. First question. Uh, Doug, what is your number one failure in real estate? Uh, the number one failure was that attitude of buy a home at every duty station and and then rent it out. And we made money on one just by lucky timing, but overall we have lost money. And by lost money, I mean to the tune of probably twenty five, thirty thousand dollars that would have compounded over ten or fifteen years of doing those things to several hundred thousand dollars today. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. All right. Uh, as a former active duty investor and, uh, you know, still a veteran investor yourself, what advice do you have for other military investors to be successful? Well, it follow your interests. If you don't care about investing, then you're still going to put money in a thrift savings plan, right? You want to get that blended retirement system, Department of Defense matching contributions. So you're going to put money in a thrift savings plan at least 5% of your base pay every month. And as you get some promotions and as you get to a higher rank and more pay, you're going to try to maximize your contributions to the thrift savings plan and to your IRA. You're probably going to do that in your Roth TSP and your Roth IRA and your junior ranks, you know, all the way up to say Lieutenant or E6, you're probably going to use the Roth TSP, the Roth IRA. And then as you get to that point where you have enough of a savings rate to start investing in more things than that, that's where you start thinking about, do I want to become an investor in real estate? Do I want to become an investor in a stock market? What am I going to do next? And it might be the default where you simply start putting more money into a taxable account in a total stock market index fund. You want something that's a passively managed index fund and that has low expense ratios. Or as you've been building up your savings and starting to maximize your savings rate, maybe you've been researching real estate. Now you're ready to go out there and explore investment real estate. And you probably talk about all the resources for that. So that when you finally have some money to put toward that problem, now you understand what you're going to do and you're going to avoid the, the rookie mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's the best advice I have for starting out. Now we can, we can talk about other things like paying off debt or, tracking your expenses or cutting out the wasted spending and just spending the money on the things you value. But that's, that's really the basics of reaching for financial independence. And once you get those down, you still have to figure out if you're going to invest in just a simple index fund or if you're going to do more complicated things. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Uh, Doug, what inspired you to serve your country? <laughs> uh, this, this might sound familiar, but I had this friend in high school who had an older brother who was attending the U S Naval Academy. And gosh, did that look good? You know, I'd see him now in retrospect, the only time I saw this, uh, this guy was on leave, but I would see him with, you know, two or three days of growth. It would be nine o'clock in the morning. He'd have a beer in his hand. Uh, maybe an attractive young woman had come over to visit for a while. And as far as I can tell, being in the Navy was awesome. Uh, when I had a chance to visit the Naval Academy, he took me around and, you know, then I saw it was maybe a little more difficult than I thought, but it was still an irresistible challenge. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I was hooked and I took it and ran with it. And uh, after that, it was more a triumph of persistence over uh, intellect. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I imagine 20 years in the subforce uh, 
was was a trial and tribulation. <laughs> well, I was our our class that graduated in 1982 was uh, the last class to have the Ricoh interview. And uh, if I don't know if you've heard this story before, but if you're doing anything in a technical field or anything in STEM then you were a marked man. And I had a decent grade point average and a chemistry major. And I did not know this, but the Admiral had already decided what my career path was going to be before I walked into the interview. So we were marked. Man. Yeah. I've, uh, we, we still do interviews at, at Rick Over's office there at Naval Reactors and they still have that chair, the chair, the, the yes. Yes. Chair outside that's, uh, man, flash why, why get rid of a useful tool, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. And the last question for you, Doug, what is your dream? Well, my dream is to uh, keep creating the life that I'm enjoying right now. I mean, life is good. I, I, I start the day with a surf forecast. I, I paddle out two or three times a week. Uh, there's some chores and some maintenance to do around the house. Uh, and uh, once we get past this pandemic and I get my vaccine, I'm going to start back into my old routine with my spouse where we're going to travel for two or three trips a year of two to three months each. I mean, we really enjoy what we call slow travel. Mm -hmm. And you're probably familiar with the term travel hacking. And uh, between travel hacking and slow travel, we uh, can go anywhere we want in the world practically uh, for a very low cost and just enjoy seeing things around. I'd like to do that for another 20, 30, 40 years. As long as I'm you know, healthy and mobile, mm -hmm. I'd like to keep doing that. Uh, I've also been retired for 18 years. And of course we've raised a daughter and launched her and she went out and married some Naval Academy graduate. I guess uh, she's a slow learner, but the whole, the whole idea is that now I'm a grandparent, a rookie grandparent. And so I'm finding that spending time with family was very important when we were raising our daughter and it's become important again. I want to hang around and watch my granddaughter grow up and see how that turns out. Awesome. Now that's uh, that's an amazing, amazing dream. And you know, it's, 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 uh, a little bit different than a lot of other people that we talk to who haven't reached that financial independence, you know, goal yet. Um, so you've got to have something that you're moving toward, you know, you can't just run away from active duty, although that's very easy to think about, but <laughs> you've got to have something that you're moving toward and something you want to do with all this new time in your life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Doug, I've had a blast having you on here today. Definitely right. learned a lot. And I think you've shared, um, a lot of great resources uh, for transitioning, you know, vets uh, or even guys who just want to stay in, um, you know, real estate or otherwise. So if people want to reach out to you and find, you know, find out more about you, where can they go? Uh, just, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been online now for 10 years. So you can probably just Google Doug Nordman and a search engine will find me on the first page of results. Uh, I'm at The Military Guide. That's the name of the blog. And that's the, also the name of the book, The Military Guide to Financial Independence and Retirement. Uh, go to your library, go to your military base library or your base financial office, or even your local public library that books all over the world now. And uh, send me an email. Uh, my email address is Nords Nords at gmail.com. And uh, I get a lot of emails and uh, in a day or two, I get through the backlog and I'll answer your question. <laughs> but I find that when I answer all those questions that I get more material for more blog posts about a subject that everybody's suddenly asking about or ideas for the next book. Uh, I really enjoy writing and I'm probably going to be writing for the rest of my life about something. Mm -hmm. And that's the easiest way to contact us. Uh, we've also got another book out there. My daughter and I wrote a book on raising your money savvy family for next generation financial independence. And again, go to the library. You'll find it there. Perfect. Awesome. And we'll uh, put all that, put all that in the, in the show notes as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll give you the links too. Good. Good. Sounds good. Uh, Doug, again, thank you for coming on here and sharing your your wisdom and your experience, you know, over these past uh, really, well, I guess forty years of, uh, of your life <laughs> in the military and, and afterwards. So. It, it happens faster than you might think. Uh, looking back, right, it goes very slowly one day or the other. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the time when I can I can get out and be, uh, you know, living on on the beach and going surfing, you know, all the time. <laughs> Absolutely, as much as you can handle. Exactly. Exactly. Well, please stay safe back in the States and uh, yeah, we'll definitely uh, catch Thank up you. later. Thanks for listening. If you are a military investor and found this episode of the Lessons in Real Estate show packed with great information, tell your friends and leave a five-star rating on your listening platform. Every comment is read and appreciated. Don't forget to check out our weekly episodes of PCI Teaches, brought to you by Pinto Capital Investments. Learn about basic and advanced topics in real estate investing. Catch updates on Anthony's journey through learn and teach segments. 
and listen to the tales of other military investors and real estate professionals every week. We'll catch you next time on the Lessons in Real Estate show.